I am here at Marker USA headquarters in New Hampshire, and our work here today is to talk about some of the highlights in the Marker lineup for 22-23. And as we like to do around here, I think we should have our guests introduce themselves. So Derek, let's start with you and just talk a little bit about your background in the ski industry and, and with Marker. Derek McClellan, I'm the US sales manager for Marker. I grew up in New England, live in New England my whole, t my whole life so far, but uh, grew up ski racing in Vermont. Went to UVM, ski raced all the way through college, coached for a year and then stumbled upon a, a cool job with Technica doing World Cup service in 1999. And uh, from there I've moved up through the companies and all the companies changes from national race manager to product managers for all brands and now I'm the sales manager for Marker and also the risk manager for Marker as well. What does that mean, that you are the risk manager? So in the unfortunate happenings of a consumer accident, yeah. I, if there's concern from the shop of the accident and reporting it to me, I get the first point of contact and gather all the information and moves on from there. Yeah, but okay. I'm the first contact of incidents. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think we often can get caught up with the little niceties of this binding weighs slightly less than that, but like these things keep us connected uh, to the skis and the snow, and so uh, we are talking about safety devices, yeah. right? Chris, tell us a little bit about your background. I'm Chris McKenna. I'm the product manager for Marker for the U.S. Uh, similar background to Derek. Grew up ski racing in Vermont. Skied for Middlebury College. And I've then, heard of it. Yeah, got a, got a couple <laughs> Middlebury people here, thankfully. Then started with Marker out of school and been with Marker for five years now. Got it. Do we want to talk about some of the inline things? Do we want to talk about some of the new things with the 22-23 Marker lineup? Well, I can start out. First off, uh, Marker is celebrating its 70th year this year. So back in 1952, Hannes Marker developed his binding with toe release, the duplex binding. And ever since, it's been the Marker's motto of safety and protection and performance. So. These three pillars are what Marker is all developed around. So safety and protection, but also that driving German performance is the engineering of what makes the new Marker line top of the binding market. What do you think, Chris? Anything more to add to the history or do we just dive into uh, the present day? Yeah, I think we're gonna jump into it here. Quick overview on the collection is Super important with Marker is have a binding for every category and every type skier. So starting off with our super lightweight touring bindings, the Alpinist, we have 245 gram binding, cover the whole spectrum in touring up to our Duke PT, and then have our free ride collection with the Royal Family. So Squire, Griffin, Jester, and then also have our front side performance binding. So bindings for wider free ride skis, and then also for your narrow front side carving skis as well as full junior and rental collection as well. So full range of bindings. When but, you say full range, you mean full yeah. range, yes. <laughs> yeah. So every, everything covered there. Uh, hop into updates for 22, 23. We have a couple technical updates in the touring line. So new easy step in toe for our pin binding collection. So all king pins and all alpinists. Uh, update is added a rubber bump stop here just making it easier to get your boot in the right position to step in, and then also a wider step in platform. So requiring way less effort uh, to engage the pins there. So we all know stepping into touring bindings can be challenging, especially the top snowy conditions. So making that process easier and way more straightforward there. Uh, that's gonna be all alpinist and kingpin. And then other update in the touring collection is in our frame bindings. So. F10 Tour and F12 Tour uh, added the ice scraper to the toe heel. So now you'll see same toe as we have in our uh, Royal Family bindings. And then also adding the hollow, updated hollow linkage heel here. So same heel piece you'll see in the Squire family as well as our Duke PT12. So just much easier step in uh, force there. So easier use than our previous uh, frame binding here. This is something that we've kind of you know, talked a bit about on Blister in terms of just trends and where things are 
heading and emerging markets and maybe shrinking markets. We have talked about, you know, frame bindings kind of losing some market share overall as we're seeing so many more options like a Duke PT, you know, come online or people being able to go into lighter weight pin bindings. But how do you guys see the state of the frame binding market? I think it all comes from the trends of the availability and the the volume of pin bindings that have been introduced in the market in the last five years compared to, say, when the Duke originally came out. There was very limited availability of pin totally. bindings or boots. Yeah. So in the big realm of things in the last, since the Duke came out in 2005, yes, frames have decreased due to the increase of pin bindings, but in the last five years, they've steadily held their ground in their entry price point area, so it's an ease of entry. They don't have to buy a full complete touring pin package. Like yeah. Maybe they have their Alpine boots, they're just gonna check it out. Yeah. So they put a, a frame binding on a used pair of skis. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's reducing the value expense getting into testing out the waters of backcountry and side country. And compared to Europe, I'd say it's about the same. It's all the, the frame binding is that entry price point package area. Which actually makes a lot of sense. And as we have been maybe prematurely talking about the move away from frames, it's interesting though, because as more people are exploring backcountry skiing, when you talk about that entry point, which is hugely important, I have, think I've been failing to consider or I've been underestimating how compelling that might be for somebody who's like, I don't know if I'm actually going to really want to continue down the path of backcountry skiing. So let, let me get in in a less expensive and committed way. In the New England terms of things, it's, a, it's more of a let's go skin the hill before the mountain opens. And it's just a, it's a different experience or well, I'm gonna go after hours is basically what it is. And it's, it's, it, it's an avenue of getting people started. They like it, then they invest in more. And that's kind of their quiver builder. Do PTs versus a frame binding, do you see customers kind of hand wringing over which way to go? Or is it actually like, no, not so much. It's for people who just want that entry point and to explore, it's clear to them. It's not a, it's not a point of confusion. The hybrid bottles of the Duke PT are kind of like the evolution of what the Duke originally was, yeah. of being this hard charging, like no sacrifice ability to get in the backcountry, but when you're locked in, you are skiing, you're as close to possible Alpine setup. Yeah. And the PT gets rid of the frame, it modernizes with climbing enabled, yeah pin set up, so you're getting the best of both worlds now with a Duke PT over a frame. So if the availability ability of pin boots in that kind of that hybrid, you know, stronger free ride all mountain boots is kind of a commonplace. So it's, a, it's an easier transition if you're already invested in a free ride boot that has pins, it's probably best to go that route and you're not getting that real stack height of a frame binding. That's the only difference is really that stack height. You're much higher on a frame binding than you are on a hybrid PT. You've already helped me understand why I should not be so quick to speak of the demise of frame bindings. That's an important point to let people get in and check out the world of touring um, before they're ready to commit. But other things you would have to say about uh, the Duke PT versus, versus a frame um, beyond what Derek has said. There's also the element of ease of use that Duke PT, there's a couple more moving parts with getting the toe from Alpine to ski mode. So for somebody just entering into touring, the frame binding's a little easier handling. Uh, would be another way to qualify the difference there between who buys a Duke PT and who buys a frame binding. Cool. I think I should return it back to you guys where you wanna go next. Um, and in terms of the lineup. So the main, the categories for the main wheel horse, wheelhouse of marker right now is the Royal Family Bindings with the Jester, Griffin, and Squire. Those are the main drivers for majority of every store in the country. And 
It is the main driver for the ski industry. It's the one number, Griffin is the number one dollar generator for the ski market. And uh, those were all developed in the concept of when the new, in 2005, when skis started getting wider, when the new mantra was introduced that created this free skiing world, it was creating a platform that allowed these wider skis to transfer the energy to the edge and have control and stability while skiing. And that's always been the model for Marker and the Royal Family and the new bindings that Marker has throughout the entire collection. So, and then we built out the whole entire touring model all the way from Duke PT Hybrid all the way to super lightweight Alpinus. So, there's everything in between for someone looking for whatever they want to do and ultimately matching up the best setup. So when I talk about setup is, okay, what type of ski, what type of boot? Now you have to match that binding in the middle. You can intermix certain things, but having a heavy ski and a strong, powerful boot, and then you put a, a light, lightweight, like Alpinist on it, you're gonna find that package is not balanced there's gonna be a weak point in that. So my main goal when I talk to customers and stores and retailers is figuring out that package and getting it the right balance set up between boot, ski, and binding. That's why there's so many different options. This is a game we play sometimes uh, at Blister is sort of the where do some of our different reviewers like to save weight? You've sort of spoken to this, but I'd like to press you guys both on this. If someone is thinking through, all right, I'm gonna be touring. If I'm going to save weight, should I save weight? Or maybe I'll say, is it recommended? Should I be looking to save weight on the boot, on the binding, or on the ski? You just said you like balance among these things, but talk a little bit, like, how do you guys see this? Or where would you say do or don't look to shave a lot of weight? I view it as, in, as I said, in balance. So like say you have a 120 millimeter powder ski yep. and you want to save a lot of weight. You know, I've seen setups where they're using a super light touring boot and a pin tech on, on that, like a low tech pin binding. And the, granted if you're just know you're skiing four feet deep powder, it's not too much of an issue, but as soon as you hit something hard or uh, you know, varied conditions, that boot binding is not going to be able to control that ski. And we want to have that package to be in all times and all conditions in control. So balancing everything out a little bit. If you have a heavy, like a 120 millimeter powder ski and you want Pintech, I would say venture more towards kind of the free ride touring of like a kingpin. So you're getting a little more power out of that heel piece compared to a an alpinist, you just need a pin heel. Yeah. That's, you gotta balance those drivers a little bit to really control that ski in every condition. So if you start chattering, it has the ability to absorb that energy. And also the boot, like if you go super lightweight boot that has a lot of travel and movement and the binding and ski are really strong, you're putting yourself in a susceptible position of maybe there's too much movement that you don't even have the force to release that boot out of the binding because there's so much ankle movement in that binding. So those are all kind of situations that you want to try and balance out. If you're having more power situation versus true lightweight, you know, that's the, that's the balance I see. And there's always stuff in the middle you can counteract, but it's just trying to find that fine package of a little weight here, a little weight there, and a little weight here. Like try and find out of the 120 models, maybe a little lighter but that binding still needs to drive a 120 millimeter ski. If someone's watching this and they're like, okay, but yeah, I get it. I should be in balance, but I just get real tired walking uphill. Chris, this can be your own opinion or things that you guys have learned internally. Would you be advising people save weight on the boot or maybe go up, you can look to save a bit of weight on that binding or ski? I'd say it matters a lot what your application is or if you're purely just touring with this setup yeah, fair. or it's a definitely a different conversation if it's your crossover setup yeah because then you if you're skiing every day in the resort with this binding 
definitely don't recommend saving weight on it, yeah. especially for the safety and reliability component on it. So that's where Duke PT is a great option or the frame bindings we were discussing earlier. So if it's a crossover setup, I wouldn't recommend saving weight in the binding. If you are purely just touring, then it's definitely a discussion and conversation to think about. And I agree with Derek, it comes down to a lot than of your ski width. So if you're on a wider ski, the heel piece and the kingpin just being able to drive that ski is really important. If you're on narrower skis, then Alpinist comes into play and there are definitely huge benefits to skinning up in a later weight binding. That while hiking, you definitely feel the difference from kingpin to Alpinist. Uh, so if you're full touring setup, it's just, I'd say, as long as you're not too wide of a ski, Alpinus is a great option. What is too wide? As, as a, let's, we can call it a very loose yeah, 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 width yeah. or so, we can get real specific. Like on an Alpinist, yeah. I, right around 100. Yeah. 100 millimeters, that's, you know, you can put it on a Blaze 106 if you know it's your truly your powder touring yeah. setup, but any wider than that, you're just, it, it, the binding isn't, developed or even considered to be powering something that wide. Hmm. So that's where the kingpin jumps into. Like a kingpin is all your, that's your mass in the US for better words, is the mass market of touring where you can get a lot of performance and balance out of it between a 90 millimeter ski to a 120 millimeter ski. Mm -hmm. And then if you really want to charge on those big skis, then you go to the Duke PTs. Yeah. Yeah, and no, it's, it's just a matter then of weighing in what you're valuing is the ease of hiking or the downhill performance. Because if you're really focused on the downhill performance, then you can, yeah, put a kingpin even on your lighter weight, narrower touring skis. I'd say functionality wise, the weight's a super important discussion, but the change from just having the pin tech itself in the toe. So, biggest jump is just in, for ease of use going uphill is gonna be from a frame binding to just having the pins and being able to mechanically hike and function properly. So that jump to a Duke or Kingpin. And then once you're in the pin discussion, yeah, it's fine tuning yes. the weight that you want. What I appreciate about what you guys have just said here is it's funny. Um, you may have heard of this thing called the internet. Uh, you get a lot of people talking um, in whether it's different forums or whatever, or writing articles, where there still is like this, like you're crazy to be touring on a setup that heavy, or you're crazy to be touring on a setup that light. And there is often, I feel like, a either a lack of education, a lack of awareness, or just a weird religious fervor about like, however I'm rolling when it comes to weight or minimalism, you know, on a setup. And people will just be like, it's not a compromise. There's no compromise. And nothing you have said here is like, our alpinist skis exactly like a race binding, right? And I think this is really important to just help people get clear on like, all right, sorry, but it's back to the individual has to think through, what are you looking for? What are the goals? What are you trying to accomplish? Is it important to get up and down as quickly as humanly possible? Or are you all right taking some time up to enjoy a more solid downhill performance feel, right? And I think you guys are articulating this pretty well. And it's it's similar to like picking your mountain bike. <laughs> you know, do you want to ride cross country on a 170 millimeter travel, or do you want to yep. have a 160, 150 mil travel yeah. and push a little weight up the hill, but enjoy the downhill? Yep. So it's, and it's, it's and similar it, to balance it, in that it, way. It is, and I sometimes feel like people will be like, my rigid mountain bike with no suspension is totally fine on that through those rock gardens. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And that's how I kind of feel about really minimalist setups. Um, and then vice versa, somebody arguing you need 170 millimeters of travel front and rear for like a flow trail. Like, no, you actually probably don't. And it's probably gonna be more fun to be on a different ride. I think it would be useful, you know, Somebody walks into a ski shop, there's a number of Alpine bindings on the wall. And I think it's pretty fair for people to be like, 
I don't know why I should go one way or the other, right? When it comes to the different options in terms of alpine bindings. I'd love to hear you guys talk a little bit about some of either marker's approach or specific design details about marker alpine bindings that you just think potential consumers ought to know. Sure. Yeah, the, the, the main point on like, in general, the binding is the last part of a customer walking in, like, oh, yeah. I got fit for boots, I yeah. need some skis, and the last thing is, what's the binding? And that, that's where, you know, some people can be rushed, some people can make a great decision, and it's uh, the main goal for selecting bindings, you know, if people are looking on online or wherever, knowing that the DIN range in the binding is a certain, uh, that, you know, range, but the ultimate goal is to try and find a binding that you have your kind of personal setting is in the middle range. You don't want to be at the extreme end or extreme top end, like compressing the spring or have the spring fully expanded. You want to have that spring, you know, in that ideal kind of middle range. So if you take like a, the Griffin here, so this is a four to 13 din. That's, you know, your wheelhouse of eight to 10 that release setting for an average uh, human size is a great binding for most everybody. And the development of the royal family binding is utilizing the energy and the direction that the binding is moving and transferring that energy. So we have our horizontal spring and our toe, triple pivot toe. So the energy of your boot, what the toe designed to do is to hold you centered and then as you increase your force, like if you're in a twisting crash or pressuring the ski even, holding this boot centered and then the force twisting out, so the spring is in line with that force and balancing that and counteracting it. And then the heel is also, when the boot's locked into the binding, the heel is putting constant downward pressure. So it's dynamically adding pressure and driving that energy to the edge of the ski. So. This combination together with this new design of evolution of skis back in the mid 2000s is building a binding that is adapted to what the main market in the US is. You know, 90 to 105 millimeter skis is the mass market of ski widths. So having a binding that is truly designed to drive those skis is key. And not only for this is, you know, Another discussion is all the different boot sole types. Yeah. So having a binding that is adaptable to multi-norm soles. So not only Alpine, and the new multi-norm for the grip walk, the comfort walking sole, and also Alpine touring soles. So a Griffin can cover that whole entire range, very simple, very low to the ski, and drive all those skis with confidence. Mm. You know, Marker is partnered up with many different ski brands for testing and developing their skis. So if the, if the product managers and the ski designers are all developing the ski around a binding, with this binding, you're gonna get the optimal performance as the ski company wanted that customer to enjoy, hmm. is having a marker binding on it. So just back to our same point, don't put a tiny little alpinist on a big 120 millimeter wide ski is what you're saying. Yep. So let's keep, yep. keep. Or if you're, 100 pounds and not an aggressive skier, I wouldn't put a jester on there because the din range isn't there and you don't need all that mass and material and the, the, the types of materials used for those big, strong, heavy skiers. You use more of a squire, a lighter weight, easier to use, and it's balancing that customer, you know, not having a really heavy item under their feet. They're a lighter weight person. It's in balance with their skill and uh, wherever their settings may be. So is that to say you would actively advise, let's say either light, yeah, lighter weight skiers, like you would not say you, you're not, I don't hear you making the case, like still jump up to a jester, get something that is first of all within your din range, but you, I don't hear you making the case of like, well, if you can sneak into that jester din range, get to the jester because of other performance advantages over a griffin? Yeah, if you're, say you're in the range of both of them. Yeah. You, it's, it's more of the type of skier, how many days, how aggressive do they ski? If you're skiing a, a, a ton of days, you're a ski patroller, spending a lot of days, ski aggressively, 
the the magnesium toe and heel ring housings compared to the composite okay. on the Griffin, those are longer longevity, a little more power in driving, but it's it's more weight. So there's a cost to it, but for someone that's charging harder or using a lot more skier hours yeah. on the product, I would go to the Justin. So there is a durability kind of upgrade. Yeah, if you're hard and aggressive on your equipment, I would go with having more metal in the binding, okay. the magnesium parts. Yeah. If you're just your average weekend warrior skiing around, the Griffin's all you need. Mm -hmm. You know, you're skiing 50 days a year, it's still gonna be a great product. Mm. So we've been talking Griffin to Jester, but maybe now we talk a bit of Griffin to Squire. Okay. Um, what should people know about this binding? So we introduced the Squire a couple of years after the Griffin and Jester back in the late 2000, 2010 or so. But uh, it's our lighter weight version, the less aggressive skier, the younger skier, like the tweeners. Um, it's a little more simplified, a little lighter weight. So we moved to our grip walk sole only. So it'll take grip walk and alpine soles. This type of skier isn't getting into that true AT boot sole and in the future now the, the, the new standard is going to take over both norms anyway so it's the majority of boots are going to be compatible with this setup without all the finicky adjustments in the, for the shop for certifications and stuff and then also the new hollow linkage heel reducing that step in force so the whole line came out just the Squire 11 in 2010 but now we've built it out as a Squire family so we have a Squire 12 with a twin cam heel, the main workhorse is the Squire 11. And then we also have the entry Squire 10 with a compact heel. So you're getting the benefits of everything. This is more of the resort use, you know, the entry price point and up in the intermediate level skiing. Just to be clear, so three different bindings, Squire 10, Squire 11, Squire 12? Yep, so we have here the Squire 10, so it's the same toe design as the other th two models. We've just removed the uh, ice scraper on the toe. So that's a great royal family feature from the Squire 11 and up. So you can clean your boot, this ice and snow off the boot and then step into the toe. So it's right here on top. Still is the grip walk. It just has a lighter weight compact heel step in. Mm -hmm. So very simple and easy to use. And then above the Squire 11 is our twin cam heel. This is more for Someone that maybe is not looking for the drive and performance of a Griffin, maybe a narrower front side ski, but looking for ease of use, a twin cam heel that is tried and true through marker history, still in our race line and our front side performance skis, just a balanced up a little differentiation in between a Squire 11 and a, a Griffin. So it gives you that option for someone looking for true ease of use. Mm -hmm. And that's the line right there for Squire. So that was a big build out in 2021. Got it, got it. I know we talk about step and force a lot, maybe just to quantify that for people. If, uh, going from Griffin to Squire 11 with a hollow linkage heel, Squire 11 requires about half the amount of step and force. So if you are a lighter weight yep. skier, something to consider there if you're charging hard, Obviously, step and force ability to get in and out of the bindings, not an issue, so you don't need to think about it. Hmm. But just to quantify that a little bit for people. Yeah, I think that's super helpful. And I think you guys have done a nice job. It's the thing we kind of, I don't know if it's our first priority, but it's sure up there on the list. It just help steer people to the products that would be the best fit for them. And I think you guys have done a nice job of kind of clarifying some of this. So thank you. And, uh, Look forward to getting on the mountain now that we've been talking about all this skiing. Yeah, it'll be good this year. New hip for me. New hip. Yeah. There you go. All right, we expect yeah. to see it on the ground. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. hopefully. <laughs> After all that touring discussion, we can get out hiking with Eric this year. That's right. That'd, that'd be great. I can save a few pounds. <laughs> lose weight. <laughs> well, thanks again, guys. Appreciate you walking through this with us. Perfect. Perfect. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Jonathan.